Listen, this is like week three of the Names of God series, this, this series of conversations that we're having about the names of God, obviously. Um, I remember, it's Labor Day weekend. This is like the official close of summertime, right? I mean, it, it's, it's over. All the fun is over. Pardon me? You're telling me it's not over? Okay, that's good. I thought you were, I thought, I thought we were like arguing about something that I was going to lose. So, so I was like, what did I say? Yeah, we can, listen, we can agree to disagree. But the world wants to tell you, summer's over after tomorrow and we get back into the swing of things and we can leave all the boats at home, you know, and whatever, whatever we're doing, right? And, and, and so I remember being, uh, being a kid and summertime was so cool for me because uh, I was like, I was like the pool king, right? I mean, every chance I got, I was at the Newton pool. And if you didn't go to the Newton pool, you just weren't anybody. Sorry to say. Well, there's a pecking order with kids, right? We can agree. And all the kids that wanted to be cool were at the Newton pool, right? And, 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 I, and I, you know, years later, they've built a new one since, and it's just, I'm just going to say it, it sucks. It's got like a, like a, it's got like a beach access. Like everybody's so, so concerned about the kids. How are the kids going to get? They're going to jump in, right? Give us some cool stuff because the Newton pool, right? When I saw it as an adult, I was like, why did I, why did I like this so much? It's just, it's stupid. It's just a big square. But they have, a, they had a high dive. Now, it was 12 feet, but like no other town around had a high dive. Newton just wanted you to kill yourself, right? <laughs> And so I remember, like, I remember, like, being there as, as like, a seven- or eight-year-old kid, and I remember, like, uh, going off of it, jumping off the high dive for the first time. It, it, anybody relate? I mean, you had to climb up. You had to climb up the stairs, right, and they're wet, right? And sometimes you might fall, and, you know, it was a long way down on the concrete. And you'd get up to the top, and you'd walk out, and the rails came out with you until you got about four feet from the end of the board, about two feet wide, and you had to walk out to the end of the board with nothing besides you. And when you're 12 feet off the ground, it looks like you're like 50 meters. It just does. And you're thinking, you're, you're thinking to yourself, Listen, I, I know it says 11 feet. I know I'm good there, right? I just got to get the courage and the faith to step off. And finally... You know, after the kid's yelling at you, all kinds of terrible names, you know. You've seen the kid that stands there, and he stands there, and he stands there. And all the kids are like, come on, there's a line. Go. <laughs> Finally go. And then you go again. And then you go again. And then you see these older kids that are, like, super athletic, and they're doing, like, they're doing like one half off the high dive, right? And you get yourself. You, you feel where I'm going? And, and, and I was one of those kids. I, I, then I got myself that I would do a flip off the high dive. And then I would do like, and then, and then I did a one and a half. And then I saw a guy, get this, I saw a guy do a gainer. Do you know what a gainer is? That's like going off big jump forward and then back flipping as you're going off forward. And I was like, oh my goodness. And he looked so cool doing like he stuck the landing and all the girls are like, whoo, did you see that? And I'm like, I'm doing a gainer. I'm doing a gainer. And I, and, I, and, I, and I taught myself how to, I'm just telling you what I'm trying to get at today is it takes faith to step out sometimes, right? It takes faith. And so here's what we're going to be. We're, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about the name Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. And, and, and the Hebrew writer in, in, uh, in Hebrews 11 you, your, your Bible is probably going to call it the Hall of Faith, maybe, I don't know, by faith. And, and then the whole chapter of 11 in, in Hebrews, is, it says by faith. Somebody say by faith. By faith. And you read, this, you read this, uh, this paragraph, this letter, and it says, you know, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, and by faith. It goes all the way down through the people, through God's people, the things they did, and they did it by faith. And, and, and so what it says is, the Hebrew writer says in the very first verse of chapter 11, he says, now faith is, somebody say faith is. faith is. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain, get this, and certain of what we do not see. 
That is the definition. You want to know what the definition of faith is? God just gives it to you. It is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. Now, there's a problem there already, isn't there? Because, listen, in our culture, listen, uh, we're on a 24-hour news cycle. We have, we have information overload. We want proof, don't we? We do. It's okay. It's okay, but we, we want proof. If somebody says, hey, I'll do this, you're like, automatically, you go through the, you go through the mind, especially if it's a friend. You're like, well, they didn't do that last time. Yeah, I've heard the wind blow before. My dad would say that. I've heard the wind blow before, Jason. I'll mow the yard, Dad. Yeah, I heard the wind blow before. We want proof. Uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, preachers is a guy named Judah Smith, and he, he says that faith is being divinely persuaded. I like that. Like being divinely persuaded. And, and sometimes we don't get persuaded 100%, right? We don't get persuaded 100%, but we get persuaded a little bit to take maybe a step. Right? Anybody feel me? We take a step. It's not that God says, hey, I need you to go a thousand miles. And first of all, he says, I just need you to take a step, Jason. Just take a step. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of, we, of what we do not see. And that's where the rubber meets the road because we need proof. And it goes on to say in Hebrews 11, 6, I want you to hear this, that without faith it is impossible. Somebody say impossible. It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So if you don't have faith, is it possible to please God? No. No, it's not. And you've heard, you've heard people say, especially those who were raised in a, in a church culture, in a church community, you've heard it all the time, well, you just need to have a little more faith. And that sounds really bad sometimes. You're trying to explain a problem. You're trying to explain what, how you feel and, 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 and how you feel like, you know, you just can't get this or you can't get ahead. And, and somebody says, well, you just need to have a little more faith. You're like, hey, why don't you help? Right? But God's word says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So here's what we want to do. We're going to skip down to... Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, and we're going to read uh, about Abraham, and I, I want you to hear this, and, I, and if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, or we'll pull it up on the screen, or if you want to put it on your devices, that's fine, I don't care, uh, we, we'll get it for you. Here's what it says, somebody say, by faith. by faith. Here's what the Hebrew writer says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now what's reckoned mean? It means it will be revealed, right? They'll be brought to God says, I'm going to give you a son, Abraham. You can go back and look at it in Genesis, and we're going to go there just here shortly. But he says, hey, I'm going to give you a son, and through your son, the whole world will be blessed. And if you know, right, if you, if, if you go to the Bible, whether you're reading in the Old Testament or whether you're reading in the New Testament, if you go to the Bible and you search for Jesus, you'll find him. Because right off the bat, God makes a promise. I'm going to bless all the people of the world through your offspring, Abraham. And through that family lineage is going to come the king of kings, Jesus. You feel me? That's who's coming, right? And, and, and so we, we, we get this passage, right? And, and let's move on here. Abraham, listen, this is what, here's what it says. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. Now, I know this is a hard passage. And I know you're probably like me. You're like, man, this was going so good. This was going so good until right then. Right then. You mean to tell me that God promised Abraham a son? 
Not only that, he, Abraham got his son when he was 100 years old. Right? I was like, how old was I when Jet was born? 42. That's a joke. You should have known better. Right? <laughs> anyway, 42. Right? He's 100 years old. And he gets his son, Isaac. And it's not that he didn't already have a son. If you read Abraham's story, he gets tired of waiting. Anybody read the story and want to see your hands? Abraham gets tired of waiting. Sarah, his wife, she can't have kids. She's not had a kid yet. God says you're going to have a son, right? You're going to have a son. Abraham gets a son, but it's on his terms. He goes and has a little romp session with uh, Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, and he has a son named Ishmael. But Ishmael's not a, pro he's not a promised son. He's a son. He's a son to Abraham on Abraham's terms. He's not the son of the promise. Anybody feel me? He gets this son, and then the Hebrew writer says that God tested him and asked him to offer his son as a sacrifice. And that's where the hard part gets. And, 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 I, and I struggled with this all week. I, I, I listened to what other pastor had to say. I was doing some reading. And, and the temptation, guys, listen, eyes up, I want to help you. Uh, the, the temptation is, is to kind of clean this thing up and, and make it more palatable for Christians in 2023. Because some of you, maybe you're new to the faith or maybe you're just coming Right, And you're saying, how could I worship a God who would ask a guy to give his only son as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice? How could he do it? I don't know if I can serve or worship a God like that. And so the, and so the temptation is to clean it and maybe say like, well, you know, in, in Moses' day, people did uh, worship like little G gods. There was a god named Molech who wasn't a god at all. He was just a made up name, and there was probably a statue of gold or copper or silver, and, and people would offer their children as a sacrifice to a, to a fake little G god. Somebody say little G. little G. But that really doesn't make any sense to me. I can't clean it up that way. All I can tell you is, is that God asked Abraham, listen, do you have the faith to give me the most important thing in your life? Your son. The only one you have. And so I guess we need to pick this up in Genesis 22 so we can understand the context and the whole narrative. So we're going to go there right now. Genesis 22, that's where you can find this story about Jehovah Jireh. Here's what it says. And sometime later, God tested Abraham. Somebody say tested. God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, and I will show you. And early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey, and he took with him two servants with his son Isaac. Just leave that up right there. I think it's pretty cool, though. Here, here, here's one thing I want to I point out. When God gives you a task, right, in your prayer life, or, or maybe you hear something and you get confirmation that you're supposed to do something, wouldn't it be awesome if you just got up the next morning and started on it? Did you catch that? Just got up the next morning. He's like, oh, we're on our way. I'm like, ah, I need to pray about this a little bit. You know, maybe I should call the elders, right? Maybe I'll have them pray about it. Maybe I'll ask my wife and she can pray about it too. He just gets up and goes. I think that's pretty crazy. Crazy awesome. And then when he, when he had, where am I at here? Uh, with the, he took him to the with his son Isaac. There we go. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, took a while to get here, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here, this is important, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy, Isaac, go over there. And we will worship and then we will come back to you. Did you hear what he said? 
He said, we will worship. Boy, what did God, what did God command him? Take your son to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him. And he says, hey, me and the boy are going to go over there and we're going to worship God. And what's he say? We, we, meaning two, are going to come back. I, I think that Abraham was already in this place of faith. He had already stepped out on this, on this high dive, so to speak. And he was doing what God asked. He was doing what God asked. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And here's where we need to clean this up a little bit. I, since I was little, I was raised in church, right? was raised in church. I always thought that, you know, Isaac was a baby. And so, like, it wouldn't be no problem, right? It wouldn't be no problem for, uh, for a dad to be like, come on, boy, let's go. Picks him up, and they take off, right? Look, 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 look what happens here. He placed the wood on his son Isaac. He's loading his son's back up with wood. Bible scholars would think that Isaac is probably in his early 20s. Puts a little wrinkle in the story, doesn't it? At least for me it does, right? At least for me. Abraham's 100. He's 120 at this time, right? Right? If, if, if Isaac is, let's, let's say he's 20 years old, he's 120, right? Is a 20-year-old going to overpower an old man? Yes. Old men, listen, you ain't got youth on your side anymore. I'm sorry. That was funny, right? Because, you know, when you, like, when you get to be like in your 50s, you're thinking, I can still do it. And I'm like, no, no, no you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. And, so, and so, so Isaac is like maybe 20 years old, and, and he loads him up with wood, and they take off for the place. And he placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried uh, the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up, and he said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together, and when they reached the place that God told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. Just hold that right there. So, the, the, so this wrinkle in the story of the age of Isaac, it almost makes me believe that, 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 that Abraham did his due diligence as a father, and he taught his boy Isaac about who Yahweh was. And he taught him, and, he, and, 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 and it wasn't just that he taught him, he lived it out in front of him, right? And, and, and Isaac knew that his dad, Abraham, was, was a God-fearing man. It almost makes me believe that, that there was this coupling of faith between Abraham and his son, and his son understood what was at stake here. I can't prove it. I can't prove it. I hate to teach it because I think it's just a feeling for me. But I think Isaac knew. You feel me? He knew what was happening. Where was I at? Okay, you're going to have to not like, stop mumbling. There we go, on top of the wood. On top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out. By the way, when you ever see the, whenever you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, and it's capital L-O-R-D, it's a manifestation of Jesus himself. Just so you know. So Jesus shows up, right, as an angel of the Lord, and he says... And he called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know, he says. Jesus says, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your, from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up. And there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns, and he went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Everybody clap that the story turns out great. That's yeah, okay. 
It's okay. And so Abraham, get this, Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. Now in the Hebrew, he calls it Yahweh Jireh. And we get the English word Jehovah, right? We get Jehovah Jireh from the Hebrew. And he said, and, and so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide or Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, now there's a proverb now that's come out of this for the Jewish people. And it says, to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, on the mountain of Yahweh, it will be provided. It will be provided. Is that all I have there? Awesome. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. For years, I've, I've, I've read this passage, and I've read Genesis 22 before. And, and, and there, was, there used to be uh, some worship songs that were Jehovah Jireh. And I thought that maybe God named him. And I don't know how this happens, but just because you assume something, you believe it, right? And, and then you have to go research it to find out if it's true or not. I thought that maybe uh, Abraham gave God the name Jehovah Jireh because he provided the ram in the thicket and he didn't have to sacrifice his son. But God didn't. But Abraham didn't name God Jehovah Jireh. He named the place. The place that he was, he named it Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. There's some takeaways that I want to share with you as we wind down today. Uh, uh, the first one is, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you can bet on this, that God will test your faith. He will. Uh, you read scripture, and, and scripture from, from Genesis to the book of Revelation is full of God testing his people, God testing his servants. And sometimes, have, have you ever heard this, a, a, a person, a friend, maybe a family member, a co-worker, and they say, man, I got this thing, and I am just, I am just being just bashed by the enemy, the enemy is really attacking me. And, and you've heard Christians say that. The enemy is attacking me. And I'm, I'm going to submit and suggest this to you. What if the headwind that you're feeling today, what if the current that you're trying to swim against today isn't the enemy at all? What if it's God testing? And, and, and the test, get this, tests make us, um, we, we freak out, don't we, right? And, and like, like anybody read a syllabus in a class and you find out that there's like 10 or 15 tests, you're like, oh, what am I going to do? Or maybe you forget about a test and, and, and you show up and, and you didn't study and tests make us feel uncomfortable. Amen? And you feel this headwind and, the, and you feel this current that, that has taken your life and, and you think maybe it's the enemy, but what if it's God testing you? And the test isn't to see if you have what it takes. Church, listen to me. The test is for you to step in to the promise and believe God for who he is. It's not to make you stronger it's to make your belief and your faith in him and you believe the promises about what God says about himself. That I will never forsake you. I will do for you what you can't. That's what the test is. And that's what the test is here in this passage for Abraham. Brothers and sisters, listen, I want you to be clear. God, it's not unlike him to test you. Don't, don't think about it when, when you find yourself in that spot, right? That, oh, this is strange. You're good. And so the, the next takeaway as I, as I, as I get, to, get down to the end here is I don't want you, I, I, I want you to know that God will test you. And I, I want you to also remember that don't sleep on the last miracle. Well, what's that mean, Pastor Jason? Don't sleep on the last miracle. Because if you read this story, uh, uh, Abraham's in his old age, and, and God is true to his word. Amen, church? Amen. 
God is true to his word, and he provides a son through Abraham's wife, Sarah, and they name him Isaac, and he, they're old. They're old. They shouldn't be having children. But God makes it so. And he promises, and he holds his word And I don't want you to sleep on the last miracle. Because the headline could have read. And it it would have been a great headline. 100 year old man. Fathers a child. That was, listen, that's a great headline. That gets, that's trending on Twitter every day. You feel me? That, That 100 year old man. Fathers a child. And if, and if, and if Abraham's, slept on the last miracle if he sleeps on the last miracle he doesn't see the one that says Abraham I need need you to offer like the best you have to me I need you to offer your son as a sacrifice and if he doesn't do it he just sleeps on the last miracle right and he stepped in to this place of faith He stepped into doing what God asked him to do. And if he wouldn't have done that, he could have said, no, you know what, God, I'm good. I'm good. I left left my land that you asked me to leave, right? And I'm I'm, I'm in Canaan. I'm I'm here. And I got a son now, and he's a good boy. He's like the most popular kid on the street. We're good. We don't want to go to Mount Moriah. And the headline would have read, 100-year-old man fathers a son. But the real headline was, your son will be a blessing to all peoples. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will make you and your descendants as numerous as the sand on the sea, folks. We have a tendency to look back. And we look back in the past. And we say, you know, the the good old days. And there's some warm fuzzes about that, but don't get, don't get, don't get it twisted, folks. God is doing something great. And it's not in the past. It is in the days to come, folks. Don't sleep on the last miracle. And as I close. I want you to realize that this test, and maybe, maybe you're in a place today just like Abraham, and, and you need to name it. Like the place you're at, you need to name it Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. I, I want you to know that, that the test isn't just for you. It's not just for you. You see, the test is, is when you step into it, you, you become You become something that everybody sees. You're like a conduit for God Almighty. I I know, I see see some of your faces and the light bulb just went off, didn't it? It did. You see, when when God's putting you through this test and and, and you step out and and you step out into the promise that he's spoken about himself and and you feel the warmth of his spirit and and you know this doesn't make sense, God, but man, inside you just have this peace that passes all understanding and you just know. And maybe people around you be like, oh, that person's crazy. You're crazy. You don't know that's going to happen. You say, trust me. Trust me. I named this place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. You see, the test isn't just for you. When you show up and God shows up and he puts you through the test and you offer your very best. What is that thing for you? I can't answer that question for you. But you're going to be asked that. Trust me. Will you give me your very best? Will you put it on the altar? And when you do, you become the lifeline for those around you. Who knows? Get this. Who knows who's waiting for you to step into that kind of faith? 
Who's waiting at the end of your block? Who's waiting at your work? Who's waiting at your school? Who's waiting wherever for you to take the step of faith? And God just starts connecting the dots. Woo! Right? It makes you feel good. It ain't just for you. And as I close, the music's been playing for a long time. That's a kind of a cue. God asked Abraham to go to the region of Moriah. And we know from history that he takes him to this, the hill country. He's not actually on Mount Moriah, but he's in the hill country of, of the region of Moriah. And, and, and he gets there to the very place that God tells him to go. And he's building an altar to sacrifice his only son, uh, the best thing he has, his most prized possession, his son Isaac. And he, he builds an altar there to put his son on. And we know the story. You already know it. God provides something else. They go a different direction. Amen. Did you know a thousand years later, King David will buy a threshing floor from a guy named Aruna the Jebusite. And it's the exact location of the altar that Abraham built a thousand years earlier. And he builds an altar. I got goosebumps. And, 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 and then we know that David's son Solomon builds a temple on that altar on the threshing floor he bought from this cat named Aruna. And it becomes the city of Jerusalem. I'm just going to let that sit on you for a second. God gives his only son. God sacrifices his only son, his perfect, sinless son. And in that temple, on the temple mount in Jerusalem, was the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant sat in there, right? And, and, and the priest could only go in one time a year. The high priest they had to tie a rope around him because if he died in there, they couldn't go in to get him because everybody would die and they had to, pull, had to pull him out if it happened. And we know that there was, there was a, a big veil like six or eight inches thick, like 60, 50 feet high. I don't know. We can, we can, we can, we can get it in scripture. I didn't, I didn't memorize it. Some of you probably have. But, but when Jesus dies, when, when Jesus gives his life for you and me and for all humanity and he takes the pain and the suffering of your sin and my sin, that veil was torn from top to bottom and it was ripped in half. God gave his son. And the place that Abraham named Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide in that same spot the Lord did provide. And that changes everything. 